I'll just do a brief presentation um, on about 50 minutes thereabout. Uh, and then what I'll do is, like you said, there's a chat function uh, there. So we can uh, take all the necessary questions. And then from there, we can now proceed. So while I'm speaking, you can have, you can, while I'm speaking, you can have uh, um, the charts sent so that it doesn't have to be at the end per se. We can be talking while I'm going on so we don't waste much time. And if there's anything that you want to talk as well, like I'm always I'm available as well so you can talk, uh, talk, talk on it. So let me share my screen before we proceed. Can you all see my screen, please? Yes, you can. Yes. You can all see my screen? Yes. OK. Um, OK, so basically, what we're going to be talking today is um, on improving energy efficiency. Yes, Yes, you can see it. Oh, okay. Okay. Improving energy efficiency in water supply system to pump scheduling optimization. Uh, when um, the when the secretary told me about this topic, I was I was impressed. I was like, well, well, this is a sub subject that cuts across different things and it's very, very ideal for the situation we find ourselves as a country and globally. Um, so the world is now going to be viewed differently after this pandemic because there's a lot of things that, that, that will change. The way we do business, the way we think, the way we strategize, and our afterthoughts of even doing some engineering calculations will definitely change. So that's what we're going to be talking about. The brief background of what I've talked about, my name is Ulkai Diolai, I'm the Business Development Manager for Nigeria, uh, for Xylem. So Xylem is a water company. Uh, we are currently in about 150 countries doing everything water. So we call it from source to tap, everything that has to do with water. Uh, we have a couple of brands. Uh, I'm not here to speak about Xylem, so I'll keep that uh, aside a bit, and then we'll talk more about uh, the whole uh, business. So, does anybody have any idea what this term means, water G? Any ideas? So, is it something entirely new to you? Yes, you can explain. Um, I'm just hearing it for the first time, water G. Okay. All right. So, what is water G? So this term was coined by the Alliance to Save um, Energy. It's a, it's a company, um, an association. It used to describe the strong link between water and energy in municipal water systems. So there's an approach, there's a mindset to it, whereby they have believe, they believe that there's a need to help cities realize the significant uh, savings uh, in energy, uh, in water, and in financial uh, savings through technical and engineering improvement in water supply. So apart from, so what we do, like in engineering, there's no engineering without when you, there's no proper engineering when you don't take in company science the effect on the stakeholders. That's what we, we teach us in, in engineering. 
the effect is has to be with the stakeholder. So what are we doing to, 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 to do that? So that's the whole idea of Waterg. So Waterg makes the best use of two valuable resources, that is water and energy. So it's a nexus between water and energy. So this is the approach. If you look at this, yeah, it says energy is used for pumping water, we know. At the same time, water supply will utilize energy. Energy is used for wastewater treatment, used for cooling plants, used for dam, for mining. So how do we harness these two resources to ensure that how whatever it is we are doing with water and whatever it is we are doing with energy, there can be a, a nexus, a relationship to manage both. And at the end of the day, we will result in improved efficiency, it will improve supply, and improved um, bottom end. Because every, every contract, every business is all about what happens at the end of the day. So that's the whole idea of WaterG. So WaterG is something that we, if you look into this uh, system here, um, it has the components here. You have uh, every stage. You have a deep well. So if you look at the extraction, you have deep well or surface, that's for water. In extraction, what I mean by extraction, you try to get water either from a borehole or uh, from a, a river. So it, the energy used here is the pumping systems. If you look at the treatment as well, whatever means you want to treat water, either chemical or physical treatment. So you have dosing pumps, you have fans, you have agitators. Uh, if you look between distribution, and uh, net in the distribution network, either we are sending drinking water or pumping a booster to the end user, you always use pumps. If you look at distribution as well to end user, you use pump. And for storm, you use pumping system. It shows one thing that is clear, and that pumping system pumps are very, very critical. It says that about 10% of the entire energy use globally is used by mortals. And over 8% of that 10% is used by pumps. So if you want to efficiently manage energy globally, all you just have to do is have efficient mortals, efficient pumps. And that's about 10% done. In the course of this, we'll talk about how to properly size the pump to increase energy efficiency. So that is why for water G, pump holds a very, very vital uh, position in terms of energy efficiency and how to optimize energy. So just like I said, if you look at uh, in the, uh, the other slide said, um, the energy efficiency intervention in water supply system, you look at the circled area in red here, shows that pumping system, proper design, throttling, and the motor system account for a high percentage of, in fact, it's almost everything. Once you can get that sorted, then the efficiency in energy is properly managed. So we will talk about some typical uh, water G uh, intervention. Here you have improving pump efficiency. That's part of the thing, just like we talked about earlier. So how do you improve pump efficiency? We'll talk about that. Then leak management. Uh, when you talk about leak management, it's it's about um, so in the pump efficiency. One of the things we're talking about. Talk about. Uh, replace inefficient pumps with efficient, properly sized ones. Over my experience in Nigeria, I've realized that there are lots, you know, engineers are of the habit of, um, when you do a proper design, you always make the safety factor. That's the best word. It's a very delicate word, safety factor. So you put a safety factor on in almost every factor. At the end of the day, by the time you come to it, the, 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 the main thing, the safety factor has overrided and you have resulted in, at times, oversized pumps. So pump efficiency talks about that. Install variable speed drives, regular presentive infection, trim impellers. You know, so we talk about that in pump efficiency. And then you talk about leak management. You talk about leak detection and repair, uh, pressure management within the network. Then you measure minimum night flow to leak, uh, to gauge leakness at, at night. So. That's one of the things you do for, for leak management. And also for system automation. So, that's, so those are some of the things that instances where people have started using uh, BMS systems in buildings, by using SCADA, telemetry, and then 
it's not improving systems. You know, the world is going uh, IT now. So people have started using some system automations to improve the efficiency of, of, of the water, water gene. And also metering and monitoring. So in this case, uh, monitoring of system, of components, uh, install water meters in some instances, monitor pump system. So these are all interventions that we can use uh, system uh, typical uh, in water gene. But what we're going to be more important, talking more about today, is going to how do you improve pump efficiency. So why do we need pumps? That's the question. What exactly, why do we require pumps? So the move water from a point one to two at a given flow, it could be a cubic meter per hour, cubic meter per second, you know, rate of flow. And the pump needs to add pressure to the pump water. So the major uh, pump need is to move pump from, to move uh, flow from one point to another. The pressure head uh, to overcome is due to the force of gravity and to the resistance. So the total head here is talking about the geodetic head, that is static head and then the dynamic head. So of course you have to calculate the head loss in the pipe, which will also depend on the roughness of the pipe, the velocity of the liquid, the length of the pipe, the pipe fittings. Another thing is also the, the material uh, of, of the pipe. So those are the things that will determine how you calculate that. We, are, we don't want to talk, we're not here to talk about uh, head loss calculation and all that, but you have an idea of what I'm talking about to be able to get a pump. So you need to move a pump from, uh, pump from point A to B. That's the whole idea, move flow from point A to B, to overcoming the, the, the head, the static head. That's the whole idea of getting a pump. And that's basically different types of pumps. You have a centrifugal pump, have positive displacement pumps. And of course, it continues. So all these positive displacement pumps, you have all this listed here. Uh, but for the essence of today's um, discussion, we'll be talking strictly on centrifugal pumps. So there are different types of centrifugal pumps. And why do we people use centrifugal pumps? It's very, it's very versatile. It's very reliable. Simple construction, and of course, comparatively uh, with other pumps and pricing. Uh, the prices are low. And it's also, um, it's um, very efficient, yeah, uh, in, in some instances. So if you look at the construction of a centrifugal pump, you have a suction site where water comes in. Uh, so it, this, is, this is, the pump here where I'm showing is, is what we call the end suction pump. So is end suction because at the suction side, water comes in axially, and then uh, it gets into the eye of the impeller, and then there's a pressure side, so it goes from a pretty low uh, place of low pressure to high pressure. That's, that's the whole idea of a pump. You know? So the drive shaft could either be a diesel driven, it could be uh, uh, motor driven, but the whole idea of uh, a centrifugal pump is it creates um, a centrifuge uh, by the movement of the impeller, and that is how uh, uh, water moves or flow moves from the suction side to the pressure side. So that's the whole idea, the, the whole construction of a, a centrifugal pump. So the, I always ask this question, um, how do you size a pump? And I get different answers. How do you select the pump? Most engineers, when I talk with them, uh, the question is, how do you select the pump? I hear it's, uh, it's a two horsepower pump, a three horsepower pump, and I hear that a lot. And in my time, I've been trying to do a lot of education, a lot of seminars of such to tell engineers that pumps are not sized based on horsepower. And you see by the end of the day. So how do you select the pump? So at times when people come to me and they say they want a pump, and I ask them a lot of questions. The reason is because there is so much information required to select the right pump to get the best out of a pump if it's just a simple i use this simple analogy if i want to move from abuja to lagos and i say please i want to move from abuja to lagos it will be wrong for you to give me a bicycle but it is also right 
It's wrong because one, I didn't tell you the comfort I wanted. I didn't tell you the time I want to get to Lagos. I didn't tell you how many of us will be going to Lagos. So if you give me a bicycle, you're right, because the bicycle will take me from Lagos or Abuja. But the timing could be different. Same thing with a pump. So if you take, tell, if I now tell you further that I need to get to Lagos and Abuja, and I, have, I can get there within eight hours, then you look at a bicycle will not do it. Then probably a car will do it. But now if I tell you it's going to be 200 of us, then you look at it, oh, 200 people, then probably you need to fly. So you see, the more information you provide, the better it is of giving you the right pump. So the liquid characteristic are there. If you know, if you don't know it's water, for water, we have a basic viscosity, the density, vapor pressure, and all that, we know that. Then the flow rate, the static suction head, discharge, the pressure losses, the final pressure. We ask all these questions so that we can give you the right, the right pump. So you look at the pump uh, output. What's the pump, uh, the output uh, uh, formula? The hydraulic output is given as G H rho G. Um, Q, uh, sorry, sorry. So Q being the flow rate, that's in meter cube per second. The head, the rho, which is density. This is for water, and then gravitational constant. And then for the water density, you have the SI unit. Uh, and then for those of us that still stick with the imperial uh, in horsepower and all that, so. Those, that is for the, um, the output, hydraulic output for pumps. So you see this output also reflects in some of the things that I'm talking about in, in the hydraulic output, we also reflect in some of the things that we're talking about. So if you see a graph like this, and it, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this graph where after a pump is selected, you're giving a graph as such to say, this is the graph. How has this graph been calculated? What is this graph about? This graph tells you almost everything you need to know about a pump. But the irony is, a lot of times, people would only utilize this um, set intersection of the system curve and the pump curve to, to know. But here, you have how many curves? You have one, two, three, four, five curves telling you different things telling you where the pump will work per time, the effect, effect of working at one part or the other, telling you how the pump will work, telling you what the power it will absorb, telling you if the pump will cavitate or not. There's so much information that is here. And how is this gotten up? How is, how is this graph plotted? So graph is plotted basically um, using, um, calculating the, the closed valve. So the pump is started, you know, the pump test, there's a closed valve, there's a, uh, a, a, flow, a flow meter, and then you now measure the power at the closed valve, and then the measure, measure the, all the characteristics, the power, the voltage, amps, uh, the flow, of course, then the pressure. So when the is, is, is or at no flow, and is, the valves are closed, it will give you the power, it will give you the, the, the pressure, and then you now calculate, say so you now open, start opening the valves. So of course, by the time you open the valve, the pressure will drop, and then you now record the flow. So it's, that's how now measuring the flow against the pressure. So by the time you do, this is, these are things you do in, in physics. You know, by the time you do the, the, the plot the graph of the flow and the head, you get a curve, and that's how this curve comes across. So by the time you get this curve, you realize that the maximum uh, pressure at zero flow, you have it. And as the flow increases, of course, the pressure will drop. That is how this curve is, is, uh, is developed. So at this curve, when you see this curve for a pump, it has revealed a lot of things that tells you how much pump, how much water uh, you can get, how much flow that you're getting. Uh, at the corresponding head. It is not static. And then later we'll talk about how you can make it efficient. So if the pump is running at the wrong, if the flow you want or the pump, the, the duty that you want and the pump is not the same, how do you make the pump more efficient? What are the things you can do to get more efficient pumps? Because this, this graph is, is static. It cannot change. If you put a pump at H2, Q2, and that's the way you selected it. 
if you do H1 and Q1, you will not get H2 again. But it's possible for you to get H2 irrespective of either it's Q1 or Q2. How do you do that? Those are the things that we'll talk about. How do you make your pump more efficient? We'll talk about that in a couple of slides. So you also have the system curve. So the system curve is a curve representing the total head characteristics. So as you are changing the duty point, of course, the system curve will be, will be, will be changing. Because if there's a static head, if you if you pump if you're pumping water at a negative suction, it's different from when you're pumping water at a positive flooded suction. If you're pumping water at no uh, uh, static head, it's different from when you're pumping water. At, and and this changes the, the the characteristic of the pump. And you see that as as time goes on. In the next slide. So in a system. In the pumping system, you have several options. You have a closed loop system, what we call a closed loop system, and you have an open loop system. So a closed loop system is normally used, if you look at the schematics, you have a pump, you have a valve, an heat exchanger, and after uh, so you have a, a heat exchanger, then the pump goes back to, back to the heater, and then it pumps again. So you see, it's, it's a constant thing. So the, the, the system characteristic of a closed system is like a, uh, is like a parabola starting. So you see those kind of things. It's, there's no, the losses are limited. So because it keeps going back and forth. So you have them actually for circulation system, uh, chill water applications and the like. So those are those, that's where you have closed loop system. But for open loop is entirely different. So you see that it affects, the static head is different. Uh, because you're pumping from, you can see the, the diagram. So this is an example of an open system with a positive geodetic lift. So where you're pumping water from brick tank to a roof tank. You see that the, the dynamics differ because as the head increases, that's the static, that's the age. The frictional losses are, is a factor. The head in the pump is a factor. And I will talk about that in, in a couple of slides. We will talk about what exactly is, is, is the head. Is head just static head? Is that just frictional losses? What exactly is, is uh, the total head? So this is also another open lift system with negative. The one we talked about was with the positive lift, uh, and then this is negative where you have negative suction. That the, the pump is almost like sucking from a sump. So water is uh, the column height is pushing water into the pump. Uh, is it like water boosting water from a sump to uh, a tank or from a tank to a sump. So that affects, of course, it affects the head and head characteristics. So the system characteristics also change. You can see that the system characteristics, that's the red line, uh, the red, the red uh, curve here has changed from H in, within H1. So I we talked about duty point variation. So what are the things that can the duty point variation, what could happen? So there are instances where uh, engineers design a pump, and then when you get to site, it's entirely different because you put a lot of factors in it. Now, when you get to site, the conditions now change. So these duty point variations affect a lot of things. It affects, because when you oversize, aside from the fact that it may not be what you are, what's on ground, it also so if you oversize, you will it will it result in your pipes getting bigger. So once you oversize, the pipes are bigger. So of course it affects the cost. It results in the cabling getting bigger because now your models are bigger. So it results in your cabling getting uh, a size a, a bigger size. And then once the size uh, increases, it affects a lot of things, lots of panels. So if you look at the overall um, results. There's a huge financial implication when you over select a pump. And then, so the power limit, the, vib the vibration can increase, the MPSH, that's something we're going to talk about again. MPSH could, ask, could be affected. Um, so these are the things that we need to be careful when we do uh, a duty point variation. We're not sure about the duty point, we just assume. So, there are so many ways we can achieve a flow. So there are instances where a, a customer wants to design a 
a system and you want to pump, you want the pump to provide you a much flow, but you do not want to use one pump. And there are so many reasons why people use two pumps to achieve a duty. One of the reasons could be you want a redu we want redundancy. So you don't want one pump running all the time. So you want a one pump and then at, it's not every time that you require that flow. So you design a pump to provide 60 cubic, but you provide it, the, the whole idea is for a five bedroom apartment. And then you say 60 cubic. But they, you are not sure that every, there is going to be full occupancy of the five bedroom. So what do you do? Do you size the pump based on the, uh, the 60 cubic and then the 60 cubic is walking and it's just two people in the, the apartment? So in that case, you can have what you call a duty assist, duty standby depending. So what you're doing in essence is just pumps in parallel connection. So if you look at Q1, Q2, so what happens is the pump would provide you the same head because it's connected in parallel. So it's going to be Q1, Q2. So it just increase in flow, nothing much more. The heads are constant. But there's there some instances where you want increase in head. You want the flow to maintain, but you want to increase the head. So the pump goes from one pump into another pump, increasing the head. So it's the pressure this time that you want to increase. And that's why you do it in series. A good example is your, it's a typical example is the, like what you have in your borehole pump. So if you look at a borehole pump, you see that a borehole pump has chamber stack and it has stacks. It's really most, most vertical multi-stage pump. So what it does is moves uh, power from one point. I mean, it moves pressure from one point to another. So in doing that, it has increased the pressure. So, that's, so that those are different, up, different ways that customers, um, you can achieve what you want to achieve using pumps. So now we talk about affinity laws, and these are ways that we can also affect uh, uh, situations in, in, in pumping. And what does affinity law? Affinity law is a simple physics law uh, that talks about flow being proportional to sharp speed on impeller diameter. That means that if, you, if the, the, the flow, if you want to increase the flow, so the flow is proportional to speed and diameter. So if you double the speed, you will double the flow. So if you want to double the flow, just double the flow. I mean, if you want to double the flow, sorry, double the speed. So if you want to double the flow of, if you're going 30 cubic, if you, if the, maybe you know your flow is, I mean, your, your speed is either two pole speed, uh, four pole, that's 1450 RPM, or you know, uh, six pole. So depending on the speed that you want to achieve, once you double the flow, you double the speed. And also the law two says the head is proportional to speed, therefore you double the speed, you increase the head by a factor of four. Now, looking at these affinity laws, yeah, these are basic laws that we always use. Are they always right in every circumstance? Yes, but in some circumstances, no. Application of affinity law to predict the impact of changes can produce accurate results, however, if the diam diameter of the impeller changes, the efficiency of the impeller also changes. So we can use affinity laws, but we have to be careful in how we apply it. And affinity law is something very important and practicable in most times. So if you want to do something about speed, you know what you do. If you want to do something about the head, you know what you do. So how do you select a pump? That's another question. If you look at a pump, a typical pump that you're seeing here, um, they're different. So most times I hear things like a four kilowatt pump, a four horsepower pump. And that is as vague as it could be, like I said before. So you can see that apart from the fact that the four kilowatt, the four, uh, four kilowatt, four horsepower appellation could be wrong. Another thing is that there are different power in a pump. So you look at P1. So the power coming from your source either a three-phase or a single phase is what we call the P1. So at times when we ask, what is the power rating? And you say, and you mention a power, there's so much into power consumption that you need to understand. P1 is just the power from the main. So that is power that is drawing. 
Now, the motor rated power is the PN. It's usually on the nameplate. So if you look at the nameplate of a pump, you will see the PN. Now, the motor shaft output. So the mot the, 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 the power come, the water, the power at the shaft. You know, there's a shaft from the motor. That, that power, because it's different. The P1 and the power, there's a, the, you know, there are going to be losses between P1 and P2. Although the, most of the time, it's, it's in some sense, it's similar. But of course, there's going to be different, there's going to be losses between P1 and P2, because of some factors. And then, so that's P2. Then P3 is the pump input. When it's a dicoupled pump, it's almost the same. But P3 is the pump output. So that is the exact power the pump is producing. If there's a direct coupled, it's similar. But if it's if it's not, because there are some uh, pumps that between P2 and P3, there's a, a coupling, either a flexible coupling or something that, that, that's existing there. And then, of course, P4 is the pump hydraulic output. So you see the differences in this power. So depending on the one you're talking about, there could be a variation in what you're talking about. So that's why when you are required, you need to know which of the power we're talking about, which one is more critical to us. Of course, the P2 is the most critical, especially in pump application, because that is what determines the shaft of the motor shaft output. But how do you, how do you make your pump efficient? So yes, we talk about P and P2, we we'll talk about this, the motor reserve power. So at, at times when we talk, so it's like a pump, a pump, a, a motor, going back here. So a motor can have the, the, the ability, it could be a 75 kilowatt motor. But actually, the power being consumed, which is P2, might be about 70 kilowatts. So at times, the efficiency of a pump it's not only about the motor efficiency. The pump efficiency is also a factor. And then we'll see that in the future. So you look at the efficiency, and that's what we're talking about now. The pump efficiency is the hydraulic output and the power input. So the total efficiency is both the P4 and the P1. The total efficiency is a factor of both the pump efficiency and the motor efficiency. How do you now determine, just looking at the pump, what is the pump efficiency, what is the uh, um, uh, motor efficiency. We'll get to see that in the next couple of slides. Another thing we talk about, and when we talk about efficiency in pumps and motors, is life cycle costs. Um, it's a very critical thing that we always try to preach. But in recent times, we have realized that a lot of people always play down life cycle costs. To me, it doesn't mean a lot. But I did a little calculation here just to tell you how you can, how important it is when we talk about life cycle cost. So um, now there's COVID in the air and everybody's talking about COVID. But at times when you look at the bright side of things, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, the world is healing. Uh, there are no more planes in the air. You know how much CO2 emissions are in the air. There are no more generators destroying the ozone. So yeah, we have the negative part of COVID. It's killing people. But the positive side of it is that the world is exactly, exactly healing. The, the pollution is reducing. So people are beginning to look at the, the earth. Are going to be looking at the earth differently. That means if we don't take care of the earth, there's no technology, there's no science that can solve some of the situation we'll find ourselves. The greatest um, uh, countries in the world have been put on their knees because of COVID. That shows how much we need to take care of the environment, how much we need to take care of the society we find ourselves. We talk about global emission, I mean, uh, talk about uh, uh, ozone depletion, and nobody really cares about it because we feel, well, it doesn't affect our everyday life. But you can see, if a virus can do this to the earth, then what do we do? That means we're beginning to take more attention. And in Nigeria, no matter how much we want to do it, we need to start taking attention of our environment. Um, when you talk about efficiency, of course, the useful power, the absorbed power, and the losses are much. 
So the useful power from the absorbed power. So what you're trying to do is you are trying to make to, to realize that what you need is actually what you use. That's a, that's basically efficiency. The electric energy that enters the pump is turned into the hydraulic energy utilized. But that's not what's happening. So when you absorb power, there are engine losses, there are leaks at times, leaks in the pumps, there are bearing losses, there are frictional losses before you get to actual what you need. So at times you absorb power, and that's what I say. Uh, that we'll talk about the P P2. The, the useful power, the P1 and the P2 are at times very different because that's what you need. The absorb power is different from what eventually you use at the P3. So what it means is, how do you make it that what exactly you need is what you're using? I did a little assumption using a pump. So I called, we have a Xylem, we have a pump called 125 SV, and the pump I just uh, called. Uh, and what I did was the power difference. So if you look at it, it was a five. Five fifty thousand. that's about 50 kilowatts, 48 kilowatts. So the differences was just 2,000. So the pump I was providing was a pump that was capable of um, was 48 kilowatts. But the competitor pump was a 50 kilowatt. So to you, you feel it's not much. Especially when the, when the price, you look at the price, basically what everybody looks at is just pricing. But if you look at the analysis, and you can do it on your own, just look at a pump, look at um, the power, and then calculate it. This is just basic calculation. Daily savings that you're going to get, annual energy savings, and annual savings in Naira. Now, uh, it's 24, I think it's 24 kilowatt hour per Naira, uh, and uh, 24 Naira per kilowatt hour, rather. And um, I did the, the math. This is just, that's about 1.7 million annually. And that's something basic. So you can see when you do an efficient uh, analysis, looking at a pump that you have, maybe you want to do a retrofitting. You have a pump that is there, and then you, you're saying, but most of the time, when we, when we talk to engineers and we talk, tell them about energy efficiency, and we tell them how much you can save just basically by reducing the power. Because some of these things are obsolete, they are old. So we tell them, ah, sir, instead of a 55 kilowatt, 75 kilowatts, a 55 kilowatt will do it efficiently. And most of the time, it's almost like passing through a needle's uh, hole. It's like, no, give us 75 kilowatt exactly. They have, I have had beads thrown away, technical beads thrown away because they feel you have not met in power rating factor. And the power rating is we want a 75 kilowatt. Even when you have proven to them what matters to the pump is the flow, the head, the MPSH, and all that stick to no, no, no. Give me the pump that is 75 kilowatt. I'm not taking anything less. So you see how much you can save just by that. In Lagos now, a lot of homes have started using prepaid meter. And I can tell you for a fact where I stay. There are instances when I tell them, especially this lockdown period, where I've told them, please turn off everything. I'd rather use a generator than pay power in some instances. So that shows you how much expensive energy is, really, when you have it. Because we're doing something with the KJ electricity, and it's, it's about 50 kilowatt, I mean, 59 per kilowatt hour. So you, energy is expensive. When you start looking, so now I change all the bulbs to energy efficiency, uh, efficient bulbs. The TV is now an LED. You, you get just because you're trying to save energy. And this could replicate in other things uh, when we start knowing the effect of energy. So how do you adjust pump performance? So you have a pump and you think, just like I showed you before, you have a curve and the pump is not me measuring up, to, it's not at the right type. Maybe you have over-designed and then you now get to site. You know, what you have on paper is entirely different from what you're gonna have on site. So you get a site and you realize this is not what is happening. There's a lot of difference. How do you adjust pump performance? There's so many instances you can do. So you can do throttle control. You can trim your impeller. You can do bypass control or you can do speed control. Uh, for a lot of people here, 
um, that have that experience there. I'm sure they will be using fraud control. And what's the advantage of fraud control? If they're doing a throttle control, um, majorly what you're doing is just wasting energy. So you're, you're still having the same effect on the pump. The pump is still giving you the same power, the same flow, but at the discharge, you now have a valve. So, and you know, basic law of energy, energy cannot be destroyed. So it's just going to be converted from one form to another. So while you try, you think you are trying to reduce the flow, the energy is being consumed by other things. So in no time, your bearing start giving way. Um, uh, your bearing will start failing. The mechanical seal you can the heat up of course because it's going to turn from uh, to heat it's going to turn to heat energy uh, and then you start warming up the, the pump. You know, and all that those type of stuff. So you can do impeller trimming. Yes, you can do impeller trimming. So you can trim the impeller because you know the effect of the size of the impeller and the flow. So if you want to do, if you want to reduce the, the head of the pump pressure, you can trim the impeller. So you can do the, you can trim the impeller. And once you do that, it will, it will result in your, your reduction in, 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 in head or flow, depending on how you trim the impeller. So, if that is done, what happens is there's at times because there's it's not everybody that has the ability to balance the impeller. So if there's no proper balance of the impeller, even when you trim the impeller, there are going to be efficiency losses because you didn't balance you balance the impeller. There could be efficiency losses because of the imbalance of the uh, impeller it will cause vibration. So yes, that can happen. Of course, bypass control. It's also another method being used, but at the same time, what you're doing is just running in, in cycles. So you have a, a valve that, that takes water back to the, from, the, from the discharge to the suction. Uh, so you open up the, the valve and then water goes back to the suction. So that, that's another way of adjusting the pump performance. And then speed control, which to me, this is like the, the, the best uh, uh, thing right here is speed control. Uh, so this is part of the thing we talk about the, the throttle control. So you can see the original duty point, and then you throttle it. So when you throttle it, you increase uh, the head because you're trying to reduce the flow. And once you reduce the flow, so you can go from the, the, the blue dot to the orange dot, because that's what you're trying to achieve. Probably you want to reduce, so if, when you're doing the throttling, you are reducing uh, the you're reducing the flow, so it goes from 60 cubic to 50. But because of the pump curve, once you're doing that, what you do, you increase, you're increasing the head. So instead, there's some instances where people say, "Ah, we don't have enough head," so they reduce the flow to get um, the, the required head that they want. So you can do it pari uh, as as it, as it says. But you see what happens to the the power. What happens to the power when you increase the head from 50, uh, from 60? I mean, when you increase the flow from 60, you reduce it to 50, you see it, it drops in power. So, but of course, like I said, there's nothing you can do with, with power. It has to go, uh, it has to be utilized one way or the other. Um, bypass control, we talked about that before, uh, where you have flow that goes back to the source uh, instead of going to the system and the effect on the power increases uh, the power required. And of course the speed, the impeller trimming, like I told you. So what happens to impeller trimming is, when you trim the impeller, so this is the diameter. So the original duty, like, I, like, like, like we talked about, will be 70, uh, 70 meter head. By the time you trim the impeller, it comes down. It comes down to 55, because actually that's what you wanted. But the effect, the effect on the trimming will be seen in the aforementioned uh, discussion when I talk about imbal imbalance of the uh, of the of the of the pump the vibration in the system, and of course it could affect uh, the, the materials of the pump eventually. Sorry, presenter. I think um, you should instead of you have maybe like five minutes there about to round off. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, speed control. Okay, so let me talk about speed control. 
Um, so there's a, what we call the variable speed drive. So a variable speed drive is visually used for speed control. And what does it do? If you look here, it will give you irrespective. So if you see the curve, all we were having before was the pump, the curves were still the same curve. But with the speed control, what you get is the curve moves down. So it, it gives you different curves of different pumps. So what you have is the pump, the pump um, system curve changes. You see the system curve here. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, um, it's not, it's not like the, what you have in the uh, in, uh, trimming or the in, uh, throttle. So when you have a speed control, it changes the frequency to meet your need. So if you want flow, it could give you the, the same flow at the same head, the same, same flow at different heads, the same head at different flows. So what a, uh, a speed control does basically is to ensure that you have a modified system, irrespective. So when you need a four, a four cubic, you're going to get four cubic. So a good example, like I gave example of the five uh, bedroom, uh, five apartments you had. So you have a, a system where you have two pumps working. Now, when you, when you have the complex, there's only two people staying in the apartment, two, two families staying in the apartment, and you need water, what happens is that this pump will work 100%. Even though it's better because at least you don't have two pumps working, but one pump will work 100%. I always give this illustration. If you wake up, in, I'm sure we all woke up this morning, got out of the bed and started our days. It's making a pump work exactly the same speed every time. We wake up, we walk. There are times where you run. There are times where you go faster. That is the essence of a pump. But the essence, that's the whole idea of, of nature. But when you make a pump, you turn on a pump and it works 100%. So if it is 14, uh, 1450 RPM, it will go 1450 RPM. Even if you are going to get a cup of water, even what you want to get is just one cup of water. The pump is going to run fast. So what the variable speed pump does is it gives you the, the flow, demand, is, is demand driven. So the flow that you require at the head, it will give you just that. So if the pump has to go at 20 hertz, it will run at 20 hertz and give you the required um, system demand. But unlike what you had in the past, when you have a parallel connection and then everything works. So that's pretty, they just rush through a variable speed drive. So that's good for a variable speed drive. I don't want to talk about this again because of my time. I was supposed to talk about cavitation and MPSH. I don't, okay, let me just talk strictly a busy uh, briefly about mps so mps is something that is very very important before I, if, if this was last this last thing i'll talk about because they have a couple of uh, slides to go so mps is known as neck positive suction head and what is it so the mps hr there's two things there's mps hr and then there's mps a before then there's something called cavitation there's no way we can talk about um, MPS without cavitation. So cavitation occurs when the pressure on the suction side before falls below the vapor pressure of the liquid. So if you look in here, so it causes uh, imploding um, bubbles, vapor bubbles, because of the pressure differential. So this um, cavitation is one of the major problems of a pump and can affect efficiency majorly. Because it results in noise and vibration, erosion, and reduced pump uh, performance. So at times when you are running a pump and you hear the sound, at times it sounds like a sand inside the pump. If you hear that, stop the pump. The pump is about cavitating. If you don't stop that pump, just give it a, a, a few a few weeks, that pump is going to pack up. And the reason that cavitation is occurring could be because of this MPSH. And what is MPSH? So there's MPSH R, MPSH A. So it indicates the minimum inlet pressure required by pump for operation without its cavitation, without it cavitating. So there's a uh, pressure required at the intake and there's a minimum that is calculated by uh, pump manufacturer. So you see it 
in the, the when you look at the pump curve, and that's what I was showing the last time. When you look at the pump curve, you see a lot of information. You see the pump curve. You see the MPSH curve is stated there. But MPSHA indicates the MPSH available at site and should be determined at site based on site condition. So you need to determine the MPSHA. So when you have the MPSHA to be less than the MPSH required, cavitation will happen. Because normally MPSHA should be greater. That means the available MPSH should be greater than the MPSH required. Because the MPSH required, you already have it. So when you look at the pump curve, you have it MPSHR. But MPSHA is what you determine as an engineer. You determine the MPSH. And how do you now determine the MPSHA? So let me just look through. So this is the calculation for MPSHA. Apophilic pressure at, at pump site, frictional, uh, the, the vapor pressure, the maximum suction head. If you look in here, you see these are the major calculations. The HF is uh, the frictional losses. This is the suction, this is the MPSH and then the vapor pressure. Um, there's a, okay, yeah. So if you look here, you see that because of the location we find ourselves as a country, most of the time, if you look at the um, atmospheric pressure, because of the elevation we have, and then it varies based on elevation and temperature. So if you look at the, if you have, uh, atmospheric pressure to be 10 meter. You see the MPSH. You can see on the second column, you see the MPSH available. You see the atmospheric pressure. You see the differential. So when you have the, 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 the altitude, the elevation makes a lot of difference. So if a pump can work in um, Lagos, I mean, can work in Abuja, it may not necessarily work in Lagos. So that's why MPSH is very important. There's a whole topic that we can talk about this MPSH on its own and we can understand. So you look at the, the curve, the, the, the chart below again, because of my time, sorry. Uh, you can see the altitude. You see, as the altitude increases, what happens to the atm atmospheric pressure? It reduces. So that is the, 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 the nexus between MPSH pump performance and that is very very critical and that's most of the time you don't get people talk about that you don't even people don't even think about that when you talk about pump uh unfortunately i have run out of time um like when when he told me i uh, when he told me one hour i said yes one hour i i don't know if we're going to be able to talk about anything in one hour to be but I, but I but let me see if there's because i just want to talk about this talk about how to read pump curve, and then we can now talk about um, how you can go into a pump sizing tool, and then, you know, uh, we can we can talk about the, the xylect, how you can size the pump, what you need to look at, how the different options you can get, um, and how to identify some of the things we talked about, where to look for them, and um, uh, basically, you know, analysis, you can do the frictional loss analysis and calculation using uh, some of the tools that are available. So basically, that, that, that's it. Thank you so much uh, for the time. It's, uh, I hope I've been able to share some of my little experience with you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Engineer Luka Yode Um We have, we got two questions. As I said earlier, we could uh, put your questions into the chat box and we'll take them. We have two questions that came. One from Aluya Peter Mary. The person said he or she lost um, the audio at the point when we were talking about to determine pump size that is not based on horsepower. Please, can you uh, just in one or two minutes really explain back um, how to determine the pump size that is not based on horsepower? Okay, yeah, so pump sizing is not based on horsepower. So there's so many things that you need to consider. Once you know that the pump is, um, is pumping water, so that, that answers one thing. So what is pump, what are you pumping? Water. Second thing is what is the flow? And when you say flow, it could be either in uh, is rate of uh, flow per, per time. So uh, that's the flow rate. So 
the is it cubic meter how much you want to move at how at how how far how fast you want to move how much uh, of water of fluid so cubic liter cubic meter per hour cubic meter per second liter per second you want to know that then what is the head the pressure now you want to move pump from you want the pump to move water from one place to another what will be the, the, the pressure at the end you need to determine that and you know when you are doing that you need to factor in because that's a total dynamic head you need to factor in the static head the frictional losses and the pipe uh, bends and all that so that will give you total head so if you have that you can say okay that can help you know, when you have those three information that could help in a way and then what is the site condition so are you am i pumping uh, water in a borehole so i need a bo i need a submersible pump so yes, it's, it's, it's centrifugal. Another thing I forgot to mention is there are two options of those centrifugal. So you can have submersible pump. So do I want to pump water from a river? Okay. Do I want the pump inside the river or I want the pump outside the river? And then I want to pump it out. So I can either use a submersible pump and put it inside the river. Since I have the flow, I have the head and I know the construction. I can even ask for that. What is the concentration of the water? So you can say, come, I'm pumping seawater. So since it's saline, I know that I'll have to put stainless steel pump because I'm going to be pump, pumping saline water. So you see those information. So just like I said, if I want to move from Lagos to Abuja, is not a good way of saying for me to get a car or to fly. So I need as much information. You want to move from Lagos to Abuja? Are you going, do you want to get there at what time? How many people are going? What is the comfort you require? Um, you, 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 get, you get all those information. So that's the same thing you need for a pump. So as much information, as, so when you're asking, but the irony is that because this trade is not as, as, this trade is supposed to be done by trained engineers. So when you want to buy a pump, ideally, you should buy a pump from an engineer, really. The, the, the real sense of it. But that is not the case in Nigeria. So you go somewhere, I want to buy a pump, and I, I can bet anything with you. The first question you're going to ask, ask is, how many horsepower? And unfortunately, even engineers have been eroded with the same thing. If you ask an engineer at times, what is the pump? You say, how many, how many horsepower is in that pump? Is that pump? <laughs> yeah. You get? So, so that's a, those are the things that you need to know to talk about a pump. A pump is not okay. based on horsepower. All right, thank you. And then that's what yes. we talked about. He has responded that he has understood the concepts now. Oh, okay. okay. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, engineers should not go about asking for horsepower when you want to buy pump. Rather, get the flow rate and the pressure required. Okay, thank you. There are another question from Ismail Arafiu. Is uh, please explain in layman's language for to a non-water engineer what you mean by positive and negative function. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't want to explain in layman language because I'm not talking to laymen here. <laughs> it's, just, it's just joking. So, um, if you want to, if you basically the, 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 the a positive suction, so a positive suction, if you see a positive suction, is, that is where the, the delivery or, you know, in a pump, there's a suction and then it is, it is discharge. So if it's a positive suction, positive suction is also known as flooded suction. So what happens is that the, the center line of the pump, the suction is higher than the center line of the pump. So the, the, the suction is fed as a result of gra is gravity fed. So basically in a, in a simple layman's language, what it means is a pump is below where it's sucking from. So if you have a tank high and the pump is on, on the ground, you put it on the ground and the pump is pumping to a house. So that is a positive suction because the pump, the water, the tank is giving the pump uh, water with, the, with an elevation uh, that way. But a negative suction is when you have underground storage of tank, and now the pump has to what you call suck. You you get it? What you call so the pump has to suck. Um, um, pump has to suck water 
from the underground. That is negative suction. So positive is ele elevation, so the water is coming. We, even without you doing anything, the water will just is flooded suction. But negative is you have to be the one to suck the air, I mean, to suck the water from the tank on an underground tank. Okay, thank you, sir. More questions are coming now. So how do you minimize cavitation in water pumps? Okay, so, so cavitation, like I said, um, to, to minimize cavitation, is you, you need to understand MPSH. And like I said, um, once you understand MPSH, you know, MPSH, there's a formula uh, for calculating MPSH uh, available, you know, and that is because, like I said, the MPSH required and MPSH available has to be understood. The MPSH required is that that the, the company uh, who, who would have given you the MPSH. Once you look at the pump, they'll give you the MPSH required. And once you know the MPSH required, the, the MPSH available has to be more than the MPSH required. So the MPSH available is basically the absolute pressure the vertical distance, the frictional losses, the velocity, and all. And all. I, I, gave, I gave the formula a uh, while ago. Yeah. So, MPS, I mean, so that's basically how to minimize uh, uh, capitation. Once you, MPSH is major. Without MPSH, and most of the time, people overlook MPSH when they talk about pumps. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Ismaila Rafi also said he has gotten the point on the earlier question. Uh, the next question is from Mubarak Aziz. Say, can you please uh, give some reference book? I don't know if it's, we can yes, read it yes. to understand about more yeah. about that. That's, 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 that's fine. I would, um, I would give you, there's, I have my email um, here, my email address here. So you can always get, send, send email. Okay. I will send you the some some information, some brochures you can read up. Just like I said, one in fact, one week is not enough to properly go through um, the, the the session. You know, to understand. So I could, you can send me an email. I will send you all the required uh, information. Okay. All right. Thank you, and thank you everyone for participating. Before I hand over to the chairman of the branch. I just want to inform us that um, this session also continues. Um, really, something on pump, as he said, is not what we can finish in one hour. You will see that we have several slides that he was unable to reach, and um, it's not, it didn't even go deep as much. Uh, we know we'll have more opportunities to take this further, and you can also reach him on this email address to, for further questions. Uh, we just want to inf also inform you quickly of our other technical sessions ahead. On Tuesday next week, by on 5th of uh, May, we have another session which is on addressing data center challenges through thermal management technologies. Okay, you have someone raising up and I will give you time to talk. I have, uh, I, th I think that's engineer Taju. I will give you time to speak. Then the second one is coming up on the 12th of May. That's on HVAC system for the control of the spread of coronavirus in residentials, workplaces, and health facilities. So we will still send out information regarding this, but just to let us be aware, I'm sure so many people wanted to join, were sending me private messages, but because they have issues with um, logging in, I think this is their first time, some of them of using Zoom. I have more than 10 people who could not join because of um, signing problems. They didn't maybe plan for it on time. So we hope that they will be able to sort it out before the next one. So let me give um, engineer Taju time to ask a question. Okay. Good, good afternoon, my technical secretary. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, my chairman. Engineer Taju, how are you, sir? I'm fine. Yes. Yeah, please, I just want to make a request that this, uh, okay. this, this uh, lecture should be forwarded to us via our, uh, I don't know, maybe via email address so that we can have a copy of the, of the lecture for references. Yeah, we are working towards that already. Um, 
we are just trying to look at people who are not on our WhatsApp platform, how that how, how they can um, get a copy of the lecture. So we we'll try to see um, uh, you send your email to technical secretary. Technical okay. secretary, please avail them with your email so that they can send their email to you and then we'll forward them the copy of the presentation thereafter. It's okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Engineer Osman, are you there? Yes. Yes. Can you say one or two things? I'm happy you are here. Thank you very much. It's really nice to have this opportunity to share ideas with uh, members and our vendors who are bringing ideas to uh, engineers. Uh, I think it's the way to go now that uh, everybody is working from home. I'm sure with the lineup of uh, topics as read out by the technical secretary, there's going to be a lot of uh, knowledge sharing, and uh, everybody should try and uh, key in to the opportunity to learn one or two things so that we can improve our environment for the good of all. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. Uh, any other person want to say one or two things before we round up? Yeah, uh, okay, so um, basically, uh, the technical secretary, you can send um, your, if you are listening, you can send your email to mdalero at yahoo.com. Uh, he will uh, forward a copy of the presentation to your email as well. For those of you who are not on NSC Buari Blanche uh, WhatsApp uh, platform, and I'd like to seize this opportunity to once again thank the presenter for a well researched and well presented paper uh, to enrich uh, members uh, on this platform. Uh, I would like to also state that uh, the series of our programs, uh, just highlighted by the technical secretary, is uh, we will line up some activities to keep us in touch. So I hope everybody has enjoyed this lecture. Like I said earlier, please feel free to ask with myself or the technical secretary on any information that you feel is relevant on how to improve uh, based on what we are doing. Um, basically, because of the challenges we find ourselves in, we won't be able to have um, most of our meetings that we usually have, but uh, we hope as the lockdown is and uh, social uh, gathering is um, improving, we we'll have physically our usual meeting. But for now, we do with um, presentation, and we hope to do a lot of presentation from next week. So, so just keep in touch with us. For those of you who are not with uh, NSC Buari branch uh, platform, please you can send your number to the technical secretary as well, so that we can add you to the branch uh, platform, so that we can all benefit. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I want to quickly say that all the branches of NSC in Nigeria have been enjoined to coordinate a donation within the branch for, for, for getting palliative and uh, providing uh, protective wares and sanitizers during this COVID-19 as part of the impact of the branch to the society and to where we find ourselves. So as on that regard, I'd like to also throw it to all our members that we are soliciting for donations uh, to buy some of these things and we are going to brand them. This is what most branches are doing presently uh, in a way to support society and have our impact and contributions as engineers to the society. So we are looking at the possibility of uh, uh, getting more nose parts, uh, customizing, customizing them and branding them NSC uh, Buari branch and with the hope of also getting sanitizers and other things that we can uh, buy some palliative to assist uh, the needy and then the weak ones within our, our midst and within the area council. So this is what every branch is doing within its own locality and we are not an exception to this. I see this opportunity to thank you once again and please the account of the branch uh, will be sent to members, but if you have your pen there, the account number of the branch is 
0.2740433. So for those of us who are uh, who want to donate towards this, please donations are highly welcome. Access Bank, NIC Bwari Branch is the name of the account. And uh, like I said again, I'm going to put it on the chat. You can see it. Uh, 0782 uh, 740433 Access Bank. So, Access Bank uh, for all our members. Uh, that is on our chat. The, the donation is open to all of us. So I'd like to seize this opportunity to welcome our vice chairman, Engineer Alima, are you there? Hello, Engineer Alima. Let me unmute her. Uh, okay, please unmute her later. Okay, let me. Yes, Ali, Engineer Alima, you are on. Hello, Engineer Lima. My chairman. Yes, I can hear you. Can you add a word yes. or two before we close? Yes, my chairman. I sincerely want to appreciate uh, you and appreciate everybody for finding time to attend this technical session. Uh, well, we want to say this is this might be the new the new way of meeting for you know for for the time being, but however, we're going to continue to improve ourselves in every way possible. And I want to say that the, the speaker, I really appreciate uh, the knowledge he was able to share today. I want to say that I'm sure we're going to call him very soon and he will be very, very willing to oblige us. I want to employ everyone of us to stay, stay safe even as we as we are going to be you know, putting one or two things together as palliatives to send to people within our, our jurisdiction as a branch, we want to say that whatever we have to share is not too small, no matter what it is, it will be highly appreciated. My chairman, thank you once again. I appreciate you and regards to everyone in the room. Thank you. That's my vice chairman, uh, Aliman. We thank you very much for being with us. And uh, I'd like to thank all the ESCO members who have also joined us the public secretary, the technical secretary, the assistant technical secretary. And um, actually, I want to also Sorry, chairman. Um, we have engineers. Well, Sorry, chairman. We have engineers yes. to town now trying to say something. He raised up his hand. Let's hear. Okay, him. okay, okay. Please, engineer. Aristo. Aristo. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman. Good afternoon. Yes. I'm fine. Thank you. you. Yeah. Yes. Fine. Thank you so much. I believe you can hear me very well. Very clear. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Um, I just want to thank the presenter and also NSC Buari Branch where I actually started from in terms of where I used to live. Because I lived in Lagos. Um, this, is, um, this is a wonderful opportunity to talk about pumps. Um, pumps is one of the components we use for um, uh, HVAC air conditioning design, uh, which uh, myself and uh, um, Oga Usman Abdurrahman were actually members of the ASHRAE. So it's actually a very beautiful uh, uh, presentation, right, talking about the right terms, talking about the right um, facilities or components. So this is a, re a really rich uh, program you've constituted today. Um, yeah, going forward, I think there should be more collaboration between ASHRAE and also NSE. I think some of these components, simple components, these two water systems, we can actually employ some of the uh, um, um, technical expertise that have been shared today um, to, the, to the larger house, which we want to thank you for taking this initiative to do. So right. thank you so much. Um, God bless. All right, thank, thank you, you very much. We appreciate your presence, and uh, we, we hope to collaborate with Ashley and uh, uh, NIMA Key in particular for more lectures on this platform. Uh, again, on this platform, we are not just going to be very technical in view of the situation we find ourselves. We're also going to be talking of uh, 
how this COVID-19 will bring in presenter to talk about how COVID-19 has affected our lives and uh, what are the opportunities that we can all benefit within this uh, period of the lockdown, especially what engineers can benefit within this uh, lockdown. Uh, we're going to talk more on this as time goes on. Please stay in tune with us, and then we hope that uh, you have enjoyed every part of uh, today's meeting. I uh, want to see. thank you very much to all of you. And, uh, Sorry, Chairman. Before yes. we round up, also, I uh, just wanted to make a comment on the engineerist of uh, Bulu's uh, Tauna is the chapter secretary for American Society for Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers. It's an international society, and uh, you can see his face there. Uh, yes. We, we are so happy to have him in our midst today, uh, participating right. with us. Right. Uh, he's a very resource person Thank you. with Ashray. Thank you, Thank you for being around. Us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very, very much, much Engineer Tana. We, we are glad to have Thank you here and we hope that uh, we do more collaboration together with this branch in particular right. and uh, we see how we can improve our, on ourselves. Uh, Mr. Mohamed right. ja Jamaldin, Thank you me. have one thing to say? Please unmute uh, Engineer Mohamed Jamaldin. Ah, who is that? Yes, see, I can't see his hand. Did you realize? Yes, can you go on? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, and I really appreciate the presentation today. It was uh, very enlightening and enriching. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Presenter. I really appreciate. And another thing I want to appreciate is that this meeting went on really, really very well with uh, participants adhering to the discipline of muting their mic while the others were speaking. And uh, really, uh, this is one of the one, one of the very best uh, meetings I, I have attended during this lockdown. Thank you very much and keep it up. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, we hope to have more lectures and we hope you join us. Thank you very much. Uh, so you, on that note, I'd like to thank everybody for finding time to join us. Please join us again uh, for the next uh, presentation, which is going to be on addressing data uh, center challenge through thermal management technologies. That will be on the May 5th, uh, 2020, on Tuesday by 11 o'clock uh, West African time. Uh, once again, on behalf of all the executive members of the Nigeria Society of Engineers, uh, Buari Branch, uh, myself, the chairman, uh, I'd like to thank you. I wish you well. Please stay safe at this COVID-19 uh, period. We hope that uh, we are all protected and our family, and we hope that we get out of this uh, pandemic in no time. Thank you very much, and God bless. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.